Welcome to the Citizens Band Radio Hour. Thoughtful conversations that explore issues of media and journalism, democracy and citizenship. The Citizens Band Radio Hour is sponsored by the Center for Media and Citizenship at the University of Virginia. You can visit the center online at mediaandcitizenship.org. Here's your host, Coy Barefoot. Nicole Himmer is a contributing editor to U.S. News and World Report. She has also been a visiting research associate at the Miller Center of Public Affairs at the University of Virginia. Her new book is Messengers of the Right, Conservative Media, and the Transformation of American Politics. Nicole, welcome to the program. I'm glad you're here. Hi, Corey. Thank you so much for having me. Let's just start, Nicole, with the key takeaway of your book, which is that when we look at the headlines today, the publisher of Breitbart News, um, Stephen Bannon, taking over the Trump campaign, and the news today that Sean Hannity has been advising the Trump campaign, Clarence Mannion would be very proud. (laughs) He would be a happy guy to see what has happened to the legacy of conservative media. It is an incredible story that, as you wrote recently uh, for U.S. News, that uh, this takeover is complete. It took about 60 years, but it really is an amazing story. Well, so what I do is I look at the origins of the conservative movement in the United States, and instead of starting with conservative activists or conservative politicians, I look at people who were primarily working in the media. And when I did that, I saw that these were the people who were building the conservative movement. So from the start, conservative media activists have been the ones who were founding organizations, who were promoting politicians, who were really bringing conservatives into the Republican Party. And so that has big implications. It matters that the media folks were there from the beginning. You wouldn't have the success of Rush Limbaugh, Fox News, and certainly you wouldn't have the campaign we have today if it weren't for those early activists making media front and center to the conservative project. What we tend to think of as a political movement, modern American conservatism in the years following World War II, the nomination of Goldwater, Nixon, Ronald Reagan in 1980, it actually has its origins as a media movement, not just as a political movement. That's right. And that's a story that starts not with Barry Goldwater. In many ways, Barry Goldwater was the triumph of these media activists. But it's a story that starts with something we've heard a lot about lately, which is America first. So this anti-intervention movement before World War II that was trying to keep the U.S. from getting involved in the war. And that wasn't a very popular opinion at the time. It was one that wasn't shared by either of the major parties. Most newspapers disagreed with it. And so these activists felt shut out by what they saw as bipartisanship and a mainstream media that wasn't allowing their voices to be heard. And this America First Committee, of course, uh, had some notable members of Charles Lindbergh, subscribed to to their agenda. And it, it starts in 1940. And then, of course, in December of 1941, <laughs> what do they do after after America is attacked? They sort of uh, shift to the shift to the margins. That's right. So when when Pearl Harbor happens, then you can't really have an America First Committee any, anymore. They completely dissolve. But even before the war has ended, they begin to come back together because they want to have a voice in what American foreign policy looks like after the war. And so they come together, pretty much the same people, so Charles Lindbergh, um, Sterling Morton of Morton Salts, Robert Wood, um, who was a major philanthropist and businessman in Chicago, and they all come together and they found a news weekly called Human Events. It's a news weekly that's still around today, but it really became the first organ of this new conservative media activism that I write about. And Human Events, I think, is what, 45? Is that right? It's right at the end of the war. Right. So their very first issue came out in 1944. And then in 1947, so three years later, they had brought on a young man from Chicago named Henry Regnery. And Henry Regnery splits off from human events in 1947, and he starts a book publishing company. And most of those 
conservative best-selling books that you read about today are published by Regnery. It became sort of the premier publishing house of the right, and it's really responsible for getting out into circulation right-wing thought through books during the 1940s and 1950s. This group of guys, and it was guys who came together to create the America First Committee in 1940, it grew out of the opposition to Roosevelt. Take a moment to talk about that, you know, Robert Taft, and it was the political opposition party who opposed the New Deal, they opposed Roosevelt, they opposed the Democrats, and but this was sort of before there was any real sense that they were a kind of movement that would become conservatism. Right. So it, it evolves over time. One of the things that people always find surprising is that modern conservatism, which is often associated with a very muscular and aggressive foreign policy, comes out of this opposition to World War II and also, as you point out, to Roosevelt and his New Deal programs. And it's in this period after the war when they're trying to figure out what the U.S. should do about communism in particular that conservatives begin to change. They're still staunchly opposed the New Deal, and they're not quite sure where to go with foreign policy. Should they stay uninvolved? Should they get more involved? And Robert Taft, who was an Ohio senator who was pretty much their standard bearer, um, in 1952, he was supposed to be a shoe-in for the Republican nomination. And nobody really anticipated that this person with no political experience and no real party identity before 1952, Dwight Eisenhower, would come and scoop up the nomination. And while Dwight Eisenhower wasn't a New Deal Democrat, he was a Republican, he considered himself a conservative, what he was was someone who was kind of okay with the gains of the New Deal. He just wanted to slow down the growth of the federal government, and he did want to see the U.S. more involved in world affairs. And so this new conservative movement that's emerging in the early 1950s is not just opposed to Franklin Roosevelt and not just opposed to World War II, but really comes about out of opposition to Eisenhower because they believe there's not a party that represents them anymore. And and Eisenhower's centrism just he was Eisenhower was too liberal for him, and uh, and it was that centrism, that middle way of uh, that Eisenhower forged that some say. Bill Clinton rediscovered with the New Democrats in the 90s, and even privately, Clinton referred to himself as an Eisenhower Republican. Right, and so what's really interesting is that centrum was that centrism was something that these new um, these new conservatives really were opposed to. They didn't think that there really was a center. They thought that it was more of a black and white, right or wrong situation. Either you were stopping the communist threat, either you were stopping the expansion of government, or you were for those things. And they were afraid that there just weren't any voices out there stopping them. So you see someone like William F. Buckley Jr., who founds National Review, and he denounces this idea of centrism. He sees centrism as some sort of wishy-washiness, and that in a time of national crisis, what the nation needs is is manly virtue and for people to actually make a decision about where they stand. And so here he is attacking Eisenhower, who essentially won World War II for not being manly enough, for not <laughs> taking a strong enough position. Um, the difference, of course, between Eisenhower and Bill Clinton is that they're denouncing Eisenhower, you know, both for his centrism and for being a little close to the New Deal. Clinton, on the other hand, because by that time conservatives are – firmly rooted in the Republican Party, um, they don't rec- recognize his centrism. They see him more as a radical leftist um, because they are defining themselves against him. Right, right. We're talking with Nicole Hemmer. The new book is Messengers of the Right, Conservative Media and the Transformation of American Politics. Nicole, what I found additionally fascinating about this early history and the development of the conservative movement in America out of a media revolution was that since the very beginning with the beginning with the America first committee in 1940, there was, uh, and then as it evolved into, you know, human events, publishing human events. And there was from the very beginning opposition to the United nations uh, and, and aggressively. So not just on a, on a, you know, a Buckley level, uh, perhaps one could argue an academic intelligent level, but also fear mongering about the UN that they're going to take over the world and take away our rights. And we still today, you know, all these decades later, we still see headlines in conservative media and talk radio 
the same kind of stuff right out of the late 40s and the early 50s about suspicion and innuendo about how the U.N. is going to take away your freedom. Right. And I think you see that a little bit today, too, in the anxiety that um, Donald Trump has helped provoke over NATO alliances and other alliances. And what this has to do with is it has to do with this idea of Americanism after the war. So before it was called conservatism, this this new political movement was called Americanism. And the idea was that the big danger facing the United States was that it was going to hand over its power to some form of world government, that with the emergence of the United Nations, suddenly someone other than Americans would be making American law, would be telling Americans what to do, and essentially Americans would lose their country that way. So there was this fear of world government that was tied in many ways to a fear of communism. If communism was against nationalism, if it was for international world government, then the UN was not just this peaceful place where nations could come together to avoid war, but it was a place where communists could essentially take over not only this UN government, but the United States as well. And so this palpable fear of loss of national sovereignty, of loss of national identity that we see now in, say, Brexit and its opposition to the European Union, that was very present in the 1940s and 1950s, present still today, but really was a live issue in the early conservative movement. This idea that you had to be jealous of American um, nationalism and American sovereignty, or you were going to lose it. And so there couldn't be any sort of international agreement or international governance that the United States would sign on to. And this ultimately has some real ramifications. So the United States doesn't fully join in things like the UN treaties, the world court. We've always had sort of a, some exemptions for how the U.S. gets involved in these more global or more international governments, because there has been this, I think, fairly widespread sense that the U.S. needs to be protective of its sovereignty. But for for conservatives, it was don't join at all. Um, and it was a big, big push point in the 1950s and the 1960s, particularly among the John Birch Society, to get the U.S out of the United Nations. And and really, that is continues to be the echo of the America First Committee from 1940 and the isolationism of the 1930s, that there's this strong push among so many Americans just to stay out of the affairs of the rest of the world. Right. It's a particular kind of American exceptionalism. It's this idea that the United States stays and exceptional by not getting dragged into other countries' affairs. It led to the anti-intervention movement before World War I. It helped feed that idea of isolationism in the 1920s and the 1930s. And while most Americans after World War II signed on to the idea of Henry Luce's American century, this idea that the United States needed not only to provide moral leadership to the world, but it needed to be an active world leader, not only to spread American ideas, but to fight an expansive communism that was coming out of first the Soviet Union and then China, and so that the U.S., in order to protect itself and in order to protect American values, needed to be involved in the world. And that was something that some conservatives rejected in the 1940s and 50s as the communist threat rose bigger and as fear of communism and communism communist expansion spreads in the United States. That's when you see conservatives begin to switch. Suddenly, it's not about simply staying out of world affairs. Now it's about fighting the communist menace, not just containing it in places like the Soviet Union, Union and China, but actively rolling it back and having a more muscular foreign policy that spreads American values and ideas and tries to push the Soviet Union and communism out of every corner of the world in which it exists. Which I guess most historians would refer to as uh, as an impulse to empire, <laughs> which I guess it, in a raw kind of way, that's, that is what it is. It's the philosophy of empire, rationalizing the use of military force in what you're doing around the world. Yeah, and, and it's something that in many ways both liberals and conservatives believed in in the 1950s and much of the 1960s. Remember, U.S. intervention in Vietnam was led by Lyndon Johnson and the Democrats. But it was a different idea of empire. One was fueled by, by containment, you know, this idea that you just keep the Soviet Union from expanding. And the other said, 
get rid of it altogether. You need to annihilate communism and you need to fight communism within by banning communists from coming into the United States, by making people take loyalty oaths. So there was a, a difference, the feel of that American empire. And then, of course, in the late 60s and early 1970s, the new left comes out against this idea of empire. They say, wait a second, maybe the U.S. isn't a force of good in the world. Look at Vietnam. Look at U.S. involvement in Latin America. Maybe we shouldn't be so involved. Maybe our values aren't so pure. And as the new left goes in that direction, then the right gets even more devoted to empire, because in many ways they sort of have the field themselves. As the left goes in an anti-empire direction, then the right sort of doubles down on it. And then you get that more aggressive, what we call neoconservatism today. That grows out of that moment. So you mentioned the word Americanism, which in the early years following World War II, that was the, the label, for lack of a better word, that, that preceded the use of conservatism or the conservative movement in America. And we really see that flowering in, uh, in, in uh, Clarence Mannion's book, Key to Peace, in 1950, where he writes about Americanism. And it's one of the early uh, great um, publications that signals the birth of con the conservative movement in America. Who is this guy, and why was he so important to what would become uh, the modern conservative movement? So for me, one of the most fascinating things is that Clarence Mannion has been somewhat lost to history, that historians are only really beginning to discover him, and that most Americans have forgotten him completely. So Clarence Mannion was your pretty typical professional in the 1940s. He worked at Notre Dame. He was the dean of Notre Dame Law, so he was an academic. Um, and he writes this book called Key to Peace in 1950, which lays out a vision for America's role in the post-war world. Again, it's not aggressive. It's it's more, you could either say, isolationist or non-interventionist, very much about American America's power being at home rather than abroad. Um, but it becomes a bestseller. And he begins to go on a speaking tour. And he, at the time, he was a Democrat. He had been a big supporter of the New Deal in the 1930s. He'd gotten a little more conservative over the 1940s, particularly because he opposed World War II. He was a member of the America First Committee. But in the 1950s, he becomes famous because of this book. Um, he gives up his career at Notre Dame, and he becomes part of the Eisenhower administration. Eisenhower brings him in as a proponent of smaller government within the administration. He and Eisenhower get into a bit of a dust-up over something called the Bricker Amendment. I won't go into that in right, detail, right. but basically it's a... It's an argument over how involved the U.S. should be in the world. Mannion didn't think it should be very involved. And when Mannion gets effectively fired from the Eisenhower administration, he is given money to go and continue to press his case for his ideas and for his politics on, on air, on radio. And so in 1954, he starts his own radio show. And that show runs weekly for 25 years. So from 1954 to 1979, all across the country, every week, you can hear Clarence Mannion talking not just about things like the Bricker Amendment, but about conservative politics. So he becomes this sort of Rush Limbaugh before Rush Limbaugh. It's really fascinating. And of course, all of this is happening at the same time that, that Clarence Mannion is really starting to take off. Buckley, uh, 1951, Buckley writes, uh, got a man at Yale. And then 1955, we have the National Review. I want you to talk about Buckley. But what I find fascinating, let's let's look at the context, too, that he's coming out of Yale, which is where the America First Committee was born as well by Yale students who came together. And we keep I, it's like in your book, we keep circling back to Yale University as as one of these intellectual hotspots for the conservative movement. And isn't that interesting? Because, yes, America First comes out of, out of Yale. It eventually is sort of headquartered in Chicago. But when Bill Buckley comes out of Yale, he writes a book called God and Man at Yale, which will eventually be published by Regnery. It's one of his first big hits. Um, and that book is actually quite critical of Yale. It doesn't see Yale as a um, a place where Americanism and conservatism are flowering, it actually criticizes Yale as being sort of a hotbed of secularism and um, 
and of liberalism. So Buckley looks at his education at Yale and he says, you know, folks here are being brainwashed to believe in these leftist ideas, and somebody needs to come in here and take charge. Somebody needs to change things. And he believed that who needed to change things were the alumni, that the alumni should have more control on what's being taught. He thought they would be more conservative than the professors and the administrators at Yale. Um, That book doesn't change anything at Yale, um, but it does make Bill Buckley a star. He, it, it's a best-selling book. Um, it, it lands, it, it sort of solidifies his reputation as the sort of brilliant young man of the conservative movement. And he would go and he would write other things. In 1954, he co-wrote a book about Joe McCarthy. Joe McCarthy and McCarthyism were these big issues in conservatism in the early 1950s. And then, as you mentioned, in 1955, he found National Review, which is going to be the magazine that he's associated with for the rest of his life, and that really becomes the intellectual storehouse of conservatism, not only in the 1950s, but through today. So we, you've got Clarence Mannion on the radio, you've got the, the publishing company, you have Buckley's National Review, you have Human Events, and it's it's like a snowball coming down a hill that just all of a sudden comes together and gives us Barry Goldwater. It, it makes Barry Goldwater possible. And even though Barry Goldwater lost the election, as Rick Perlstein writes, they won the party. And Barry Goldwater made Ronald Reagan possible. Exactly. I mean, these are – nobody knows that this is going to happen at the time. But between 1955 and 1965, you essentially have the birth – of this new conservative media complex. Um, as you mentioned, all of these different outlets that are promoting conservatism. And by 1964, you have Barry Goldwater winning the nomination. I mean, yes, yes, he loses, but the, the Republican Party becomes a conservative party. And that's key. But I think what's also key here, because we kind of know that story, right? We know that conservatives kind of come up through the 50s. They um, have Goldwater, Goldwater loses. But what's so important to understand is that Goldwater doesn't come out of nowhere. He's promoted as the conservative candidate of the Republican Party by these same people we've just been talking about. So when there's a draft Goldwater movement in 1960, it's led by Clarence Mannion, the same person who thought up the idea of Goldwater's best-selling book, Conscience of the Conservatives. And it wasn't just that Mannion brought up this idea. He got the ghostwriter, and when he couldn't find a publisher, he self-published it, um, and he distributed it, and he made sure that Goldwater became the face of conservatism, and he did the political groundwork that it took to turn Goldwater from a senator into a presidential candidate. And while the 1960 campaign didn't work, soon after, Bill Rusher, who was the publisher of National Review, takes up the cause, and he begins to organize, along with a friend, Cliff White, to make Barry Goldwater the nominee in 1964. And so from the start, you have people like you see with Roger Ailes and Steve Bannon and Sean Hannity of the Trump camp today. You have these conservative media figures shaping Barry Goldwater and turning him into the conservative candidate and then doing the legwork to get him the nomination in 1964. And it's it really is so fascinating that the the media professionals were a part of this political movement from day one. They were there actually making it happen. So in a sense, and we'll certainly talk more about this before we're done today, but in a sense, Fox News makes it, – it, it's totally predictable that, that you have this huge media engine that is a part of the conservative political apparatus – because these media engines have always been a part of the conservative political apparatus. And, and all, it's since, it's since the post-World War II era, since the late 40s, they've always been there. They've been part of this thing. Right, and it's so important to understand that, because when Rush Limbaugh, when Fox News come along, it has for 20 to 30 years been part of what it means to be conservative, to seek out these alternative media sources. So part of what it means to be a conservative in America is to reject what we now call the mainstream media and to look for other media sources. So that audience was built right in. And something like Fox News, Fox News wasn't the first attempt to have a conservative television network. 
in um, the aftermath of Goldwater's loss, a man named David Dye came up with this plan to buy shares in CBS. He was going to have so many conservatives come together and buy so many shares that conservatives would then take over CBS, which was one of the three major networks of the day. Now, they can never get a controlling invest in CBS. Um, that's a lot of money and a lot of shares. So they had to wait. And what they had to wait for was the rise of cable. And when there were more options, when there was more room on television for more voices, then they were able to move forward with a conservative network that they had been wanting and working for, for, let's say, Fox is founded in 1996, that they had been working for for at least 30 years. So we have to bring up the John Birch Society and what happened to them. And when the Birchers were purged from the conservative movement in 1965, explain the John Birch Society. There's a lot of people listening who have, have heard that, but they don't necessarily know what that is and why that plays such an important role in this evolution of the history of the conservative movement in America, and particularly its relationship to the media. Of course. So the John Birch Society is founded by a man named Robert Welch in 1958. And it's this sort of semi-secret society that was based on the idea that Americans could, as individuals from the grassroots, begin to fight communism. So it was this anti-communist society, and it was really run from the top down. So Bob Welch was sort of a dictatorial leader of this group, And one of the problems with having Bob Welch so closely identified with the John Birch Society is that Welch had this theory that Dwight Eisenhower was a conscious agent of the communist conspiracy. So he believed that Eisenhower was actually working to promote communism in the United States, and he was doing so consciously. Now, we're used to having people call the president communist. Um, That's something that we hear all the time now. But at the time, this was a pretty radical thing today, essentially to say he was essentially accusing Eisenhower of treason um, in a political culture that just didn't do things like that. And so it pretty quickly got a, a reputation for conspiracism, for secrecy. And in 1961, the media discovered the John Birch Society, and it became the face of conservatism. So the way that conservatism was talked about in mainstream media like the New York Times, like Time Magazine, was through the John Birch Society. This idea that there was something kind of nutty about about conservatism and that made it really easy to just dismiss conservatism, to say it's not really legitimate, that it's just a bunch of conspiracy theorists. And for the people who had been building the conservative movement, particularly the people at National Review, who are very dedicated to conservative ideas and conservative policies, the idea of being tarred as just kind of nutty, loopy John Birchers was something that drove them crazy. And so what they wanted to do immediately after all those stories were published in 1962, Bill Buckley wanted to say the Birchers have nothing to do with conservatism. The problem was Bill Buckley and the National Review weren't the only voice within conservatism. You had people like Clarence Mannion, who was a member of the Birch Society, sat on the National Council of the John Birch Society, and believed that, yes, look, Bob Welch's thoughts on Eisenhower, kind of kooky, but that the people who were part of the Birch Society were the important grassroots heart of the conservative movement. And you couldn't just 
push them out. And so um, Clarence Mannion, because he also sat on the board of National Review's um, National Review, he sat on National Review's board, he sort of healed the breach. And so there's no public break with Birch Society until after the 1964 election. So many times during the 1964 election, Barry Goldwater was called a kook and called nuts. And people would point to the John Birch Society and try to tie the two of them together, tie Goldwater to the Birch Society to make it look like he believed in kind of crazy things and that he didn't have legitimate political beliefs. And so there was a sense after the election that any attachment to the Birch Society came with a real cost. And so after, uh, after the election in 1965, Bill Buckley writes some pretty hard-hitting editorials and effectively purges the conservative movement of the Birch Society. It wasn't something that all conservatives agreed on. There were lots of cancellations. There was a real schism in the conservative movement because of this. But National Review sort of planted its flag for responsible conservatism and used the magazine not just to promote conservative ideas, but to draw boundary lines around the conservative movement. And that was a big role that conservative media played and and still play today. And the words they used at the time, you just mentioned, responsible conservatives, that was where they drew the line, and that's how Buckley described it. Those of us at uh, National Review and the educated conservatives were the responsible ones and the John Birchers and the conspiracy theorists and those who think that Eisenhower is a, is a communist agent, they're the irresponsible conservatives. That's right. And that language is really important. And it had been part of Buckley's project from really the 1950s. So in the 1950s, Buckley does something very similar with anti-Semitic writers who were part of the conservative movement. When people who wrote for anti-Semitic magazines wanted to write for National Review, Buckley said no. And he tried to push those people as far away as possible from the magazine because he understood that if you get in bed with irresponsible conspiracy theorists, hate mongers, that's going to tar the entire movement. And so this idea of responsible conservatism was really important to Buckley. And I think it's, it remains quite important to, to different parts of conservative media today. So if you, if you notice with the... Um, with National Review in 2016, they had a whole issue dedicated to against Trump. And they were trying to do the same thing. They were trying to draw a line and say, Trump is not one of us. And if you want to be a responsible and be a conservative, you can't support his candidacy. And so you see a lot of that same, at least attempt to draw lines like Buckley had done in the 1960s. The problem is there are so many more conservative media voices today that National Review doesn't have the same power that it did in the 1960s. And arguably with Trump appointing and hiring Steve Bannon to run his campaign, what they're now calling the quote-unquote alternative right or the alt-right, that's Buckley's irresponsible conservatives, and they've they've uh, come home to roost. Absolutely. I mean, he's you know, you mentioned at, at the beginning of the show that Clarence Mannion would be you know, <laughs> thrilled to see how involved um, conservative media are with this campaign. But I think that he would uh, probably wonder about the word conservative applied to this group, because I think that you're right. The alternative right or the alt-right does represent the same kinds of forces that Buckley was so intent on purging from conservatism, not just the conspiracism of the Birch Society, but also the anti-Semitism of the 1950s. Um, he tried to clean up, eventually, some of the, the racism within the magazine. I wouldn't say he did a thorough job of that. But that commitment to putting conservative ideas first and trying to push away the kinds of things that could be used to tar the movement, that had been front and center with Buckley's project, um, Breitbart is less interested in conservative ideas and more interested in sort of that conspiracism and that, that muck. And in fact, Breitbart uh, came out with a piece earlier this week where they tried to make clear that they don't consider themselves conservative. They don't consider themselves right-wing. They consider themselves populist nationalists. And in the 1960s, National Review had a whole spread about why populism was the antithesis of conservatism, why the two weren't compatible at all. And you see those same fights playing out in the 2016 campaign. And you arguably see in 
in Breitbart or Breitbart or however you pronounce it in the work of Steve Bannon, you you really see and and certainly in the uh, the demagoguery of uh, of Donald Trump, you see the John Birch Society at work. I mean, it is absolutely stunning the degree to which what was once really purged from the party, aggressively purged from the party, how it has come back to to take over the party. And there is there there appears to be, at least within the party, no way to stop it, no way to oppose it. Right. And I think what's important to understand is that somebody like Buckley, someone like Mannion, these were people who didn't believe there should be no establishment, that there should be no gatekeepers or no orthodoxies. They believed that there should be, but just that most institutions had embraced liberal orthodoxies and liberal establishments, and they wanted to do away with those. But they believed in hierarchy, they believed in order, they believed in institutions, and they definitely believed in gatekeepers. They saw themselves as gatekeepers. And the problem that conservatism and the Republican Party are facing today is that over the past 20 to 30 years, the whole concept of an establishment of gatekeepers has been annihilated. And now that people are desperate to draw boundaries again, it's not clear that there's anyone who has the authority within the conservative movement or within the Republican Party to draw those boundaries. And it it represents a real quandary for conservatives and Republicans going forward after the 2016 election, because how do you gatekeep when there's no gate left? We're talking with Nicole Hemmer. The new book is Messengers of the Right, Conservative Media, and the Transformation of American Politics. Nicole writes for U.S. News and World Report, and she is a research associate at the Miller Center of Public Affairs at the University of Virginia. Nicole, at the very end of your book, you touch on Air America and MSNBC, efforts to sort of pick up on the the liberal populism and the the left wing um, sensibilities, political sensibilities in the country, and and give them full flower in the media, but Air America crashed and burned. It it didn't work at all. What's the takeaway there? Why didn't it work? Well, I think one of the reasons it didn't work is because you know MSNBC tries to take a liberal turn in two thousand and six. And it's really copying the efforts of Fox News, but it's trying to copy the successes of this second generation of conservative media without understanding why it was successful. There isn't on the liberal side the same idea of the conservative media bias or this idea that only overtly left-leaning media can be trusted. Um, That distrust in mainstream media is, I think, a necessary component for having a large group of people really seeking out ideological media and relying on ideological media, be it conservative or be it liberal. Now, I do think that we're seeing more of that develop, but I think that especially now that there are more and more news sources available to people, you're seeing left-leaning Internet sites survive. Um, MSNBC is doing better than it was. I wouldn't say it's doing particularly well. And I don't know that it will ever be as as um, popular, as influential as Fox News. And I think that's because, you know, liberals still feel comfortable getting their news and their information both from ideological news sources, but also from CNN, from the New York Times, from uh, the Chicago Tribune. They, they feel like they don't have to go seek out specifically liberal news sources. Um, and, you know, the conservative response to that is, well, you know, the New York Times is left-leaning, CNN is left-leaning. Um, and, you know, that's certainly up for debate. But what we can say is that the project of the New York Times is very different from the project of Fox News, very different from something like uh, Rush Limbaugh's show. These are organizations that are devoted to uh, an explicitly conservative worldview, whereas if someone thinks that the New York Times tilts to the left, it's not what it's consciously trying to do, right? It's consciously trying to hold up an idea of objective news reporting. Um, And if it happens to reflect a more liberal worldview, well, then that's what happens. But it's not necessarily pursuing 
a left wing agenda. And so they're doing two very different things. Um, but but liberals don't distrust that search for objective news in quite the same way that conservatives do. And so without that much longer tradition of distrust in mainstream media, you don't have that same appetite for a left-wing version of Fox News. You mentioned this explicit conservative worldview. And when we look at the long arc of this story since the 1940s, we see really an aggressive assault in that conservative worldview on the government, on public schools, on journalism, which we could make the case these are the, you know, the foundational uh, institutions that support a constitutional democracy. I mean, here I am in Charlottesville. You've worked with the Miller Center. That's the very founding vision of the University of Virginia, of Thomas Jefferson. The public education was not just about schools. It was about journalism and professionals educating citizens to, to fight power. And, uh, and a representative government would be educated citizens making the best decisions for most people in the nation. And these institutions that the founders gave us, government, schools, free press, they are under assault and have been since the end of World War II by this conservative worldview. What are we to make of that? Well, I think it's important to understand what conservatives were thinking when they decided to take on those institutions. There was a belief in the 1940s and 50s and 60s that government, schools, journalists were objective and neutral, that there was no ideology in American politics, that what we had was sort of a a centrist technocracy um, or a centrist expert-driven government and set of institutions that didn't reflect any ideology. And conservatives looked at those same institutions and they said, hang on a second, those institutions are actually deeply biased toward liberalism. They're deeply biased toward the New Deal. They're deeply biased toward secularism. They're deeply biased by values that are essentially un-American. And so what they said was, okay, we have to do something to get those American ideas, these conservative ideas, to be reflected in those institutions. And so for Bill Buckley, it was making Yale more conservative. Um, For Clarence Mannion, it was creating a a devotion to a conservative government or smaller government, um, that it was about calling out liberal bias in journalism so that journalists really would abide by rules of objectivity and wouldn't present a biased worldview to Americans, because that's what conservatives saw as the danger facing the United States in the 50s and 60s, and I think to a certain extent still today, that the institutions of America had been taken over by liberals, and the values that those institutions were promoting were making America weaker. So they didn't want to necessarily abolish those institutions. They wanted to take them over. So they wanted to take over what they saw both. They saw the Republican Party and the Democratic Party as both espousing these liberal ideas. So they wanted to take over one of those parties so that their ideas could be heard. They saw newspapers as reflecting um, liberal ideas. And so they created their own media so that conservative ideas could be heard. Um, They tried to create some schools. They ended up founding a lot of think tanks. Um, to compete with institutions of higher education because they believed that there needed to be alternative institutions that reflected conservative ideas. Now, I think that in the past 20 or 30 years, there's actually been a move away from simply contesting institutions, simply having your ideas out there as well, and toward the kind of institutional nihilism that you're talking about, where all government is bad government, all universities should be turned into trade schools and, and shouldn't be teaching sort of liberal arts and those sorts of things, um, and that all news is corrupt and biased, and so all news outlets should either be hard right or hard left. And that's something that I think is new and something that is possibly more troubling than what you saw happening um, with conservatives in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. So just to wrap up here, Nicole, given the backstory uh, 
that you you've written about so beautifully in your in your new book, the backstory to modern conservatism in America and conservative media. What are we to make of Donald Trump? What are we to make of his success uh, with the Republican Party? And and as you're right, the guy now running the Republican campaign for the White House, Steve Bannon, has has said, "I'm not a conservative." Breitbart, we're, we're not conservatives. It's not about conservatism anymore. It's about this really angry, arguably white populism in America. Right. So this is something that, as a historian, I can only sort of pose ideas for what might happen because we don't really know what is going to happen. But it seems to me that we are in a moment of fundamental transformation in American politics that we have been thinking about politics for the last 40 years in terms of liberalism versus conservatism. And there's a reorientation happening. I don't know if it's going to be, you know, populism versus neoliberalism or uh, anti-globalism versus globalism, but there's a rearrangement that's happening in American politics. And for conservatives, traditional conservatives, these, this, these conservatives I've spent my whole life studying, they seem to be struggling to retain power. They seem to have come at least to the end of one cycle in the conservative movement because they're losing control of the Republican Party, and they're finding out that the Republican base, which we all thought was made up of conservatives who were rigidly devoted to conservative ideas and conservative policies and were becoming further and further right, that actually there were a whole lot of populists mixed up in there who liked conservatism's anti-establishment nature but didn't actually care all that much about many of the conservative policies that we thought were were front and center. And so you see groups um, like who we call the reformicons, the reform conservatives, who after 2012 came up with all of these brilliant new policies and this new way forward for the conservative movement that would put conservative ideas front and center. And they've gone nowhere. And Donald Trump has taken over the, the Republican Party and has brought along with him this kind of alt-right media. And I'm not sure what happens next. Because either there's going to be a schism between responsible and irresponsible conservatism, conservatives, and each side of that movement gets smaller, or worse, they're going to blend together. And some of that toxic white nationalism and anti-Semitism is going to infect the conservative movement and turn it into something that is much less palatable to many Americans than it has been over the last 30 or 40 years. The new book is Messengers of the Right conservative media, and the transformation of American politics. Author Nicole Hemmer writes for U.S. News & World Report and has been a research associate at UVA's Miller Center of Public Affairs. Nicole, it's been a terrific privilege to talk with you. Congratulations on the new book. It really is a must-read book, and I, I, I just finished it this weekend. It is fantastic, and I can't recommend it strongly enough. Thank you for uh, all the hard work you put into it and for everything you do. Thank you so much, Chloe. I really enjoyed this. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to the Citizens Band Radio Hour, a production of the Center for Media and Citizenship at the University of Virginia. Archived podcasts are available online at mediaandcitizenship.org. The executive producers for the program are Siva Vadianathan and Koi Barefoot.